Martin Lawyer and assisting South Australian businesses up there in the gallery it today. Being two o'clock, in accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. Um, I think we're going to deal first with grievances. Clark, would you like to condolence motion? Condolence motion relating to the death of former Senator, the Right Honourable Reginald Grieve Withers. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in connection with the death of the Right Honourable Reginald Grieve Withers has been debated in the Federation Chamber and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion and I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter immediately. The question is that the motion moved by the Honourable the Prime Minister be agreed to. As a mark of respect, I ask all present to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House. We move to questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Australians want to know, is the Prime Minister still committed to forcing families to pay his new GP tax every time they visit a doctor? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm very committed, the government's very committed to keeping our Medicare system sustainable. That's what we want, a sustainable Medicare system. We want a sustainable Medicare system. A decade ago, Medicare cost us $8 billion. Uh, today, it costs us $10 billion. There in a decade's, time, on my left in a decade's time, it'll cost us $34 billion. So it's $8 billion. Uh, it's $8 billion uh, Ten years ago, 20 billion today, 34 billion uh, in a decade's time. We have got to make our Medicare system, our great Medicare system, sustainable. That's the first point to make. Second point to make, uh, Madam Speaker, is that there's nothing wrong with having price signals in the system. Nothing wrong at all with having price signals in the system. Member for uh, it was, in fact. Uh, uh, the great former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, who uh, first proposed a uh, price signal uh, in our Medicare system, the Labor Party's uh, assistant treasurer, uh, he supports a price signal in our health system. Uh, the member for Jagger Jagger the Prime, the Prime uh, supported uh, well, we'll a review the process. The Prime, the Prime Minister will resume his seat. Questions are asked. I am not going to have this perpetual wall of noise and interjection going on while an answer is being given. If it is to continue, then many people will leave the chamber. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister to continue his answer. Uh, and those and Madam, who want early marks can have them. And, and Madam Speaker, uh, the third principle is that we do want to fund the Medical Research Future Fund. We do want to ensure that Australia's outstanding medical researchers, I those who are so good at creating the treatments and the cures of the future, are properly supported in the years to come. I warn the come. member for Ballarat. So, Madam Speaker, uh, we need a sustainable Medicare. Uh, we think there should be price signals in the system. We think that's good policy. Uh, we do want to see the Medical Research Future Fund take shape. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, we are talking constructively and collegially uh, to crossbench senators. We'd be happy to talk to members opposite, uh, if only they weren't so determined to sabotage uh, good public policy. We'd be happy to talk to members opposite if they were prepared to actually be part of the solution, having created the problem. So, Madam Speaker, that's the what's happening. Greenway. Uh, we want a sustainable Medicare. We want to see price signals in the system. We want to see the Medical Research Future Fund. Uh, take shape, uh, and we are talking to the crossbench in the Senate to bring about all these good ends. I call the honourable member for Casey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
And I asked the Prime Minister to advise the House how infrastructure projects will create jobs and strengthen the Victorian economy. And can he further advise the House what threats there are to the Victorian economy? I call your honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I do thank the member for Casey for his question, and I thank him for his support for the East-West Link, which will do so much uh, for the, the people of his electorate Chifley and for the people of Melbourne. A. Now, Madam Speaker, Melbourne is a great city, but it is a great city that is currently choking on its own traffic. Victoria is an economic powerhouse, but it needs the infrastructure of the 21st century, particularly the roads of the 21st century, if it is to grow as it should. Now, Madam Speaker, the I member for McMahon. say to everyone uh, who has ever been stuck in traffic on Hoddle Street, on Flemington Road, on Alexandra Parade, I say to all of those people, and that must be just about everyone in Melbourne, vote for the solution. Don't vote for the problem. Vote for Dennis Napthine, who the will build the Carayo East West Link, the not for, for the Labor Ports Party, which warned. wants to tear up the contracts. Now, Madam Speaker, East West Link Stage 1. It will get rid of 23 sets of traffic lights. It will give back to inner city residents their suburbs and their parks. Uh, it will save 20 minutes every single day uh, for the occupants of 100,000 cars and trucks. And best of all, Madam Speaker, best of all, Madam Speaker, it will create almost 4,000 jobs. East West Link Stage One. Uh, it will create almost 4,000 jobs. Combined with East West Link Stage 2, that's 7,000 7, jobs for Melbourne. And I've said it any number of times the in Victoria. The member for Greenway will leave under 94A. <laughs> I've said it any number of times in Victoria, including just a couple of weeks ago. But, Madam Speaker, I'll be Madam Speaker, on my right. everybody welcome that. That's a big improvement. Even you guys. Will. Prime Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, I, I'm, I'm invited. To, to hold a press conference uh, on this tomorrow, Madam Speaker, I, I might suggest that the leader of the opposition uh, should uh, revisit should revisit this subject because, Madam Speaker, who said this? The new East-West link is crucial to jobs and economic growth. I wonder who said that. I wonder who said that. Well, it was. Someone called Bill Shorten, National Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union. Right. Madam Speaker, speaking of press conferences, who said this on East West Link? Doing nothing is not an option. Well, again, it was someone called Bill Shorten, Brendan O'Connor, Julia Gillard, and Nicola Rocks. And Madam Speaker, what's got into them? I tell you what, Madam Speaker. They are now putting green preferences ahead the the of the Griffith? infrastructure and the jobs that Melbourne need. On the Shame order. on the them. The member will resume his seat. Correct titles. There will be silence before I give the call to the, leader, the, the honourable leader of the opposition, and that includes on my right. The Honourable Prime Minister. He did have the call. The Honourable Prime Minister. And for your benefit alone, I will repeat it. The Honourable Prime Minister had the call. Mm -hmm. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister genuinely believes that taxing the sick and the vulnerable every time they go to the doctor is in Australia's long-term national interest, will the Prime Minister take his unfair GP tax to the next election? Yeah. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I, 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 know, I know the Leader of the Opposition is uh, uh, doing a fine line in indignation, but if he's so indignant about the proposal for a Medicare co-payment, a uh, proposal that his uh, one-time mentor, Wakefield former Prime Minister warned. Bob Hawke, actually put in place, now. if he's so indignant uh, about uh, a Medicare co-payment, when is he going to remove the PBS co-payment? Because all of the arguments, 
all of the arguments that the Leader of the Opposition is making against the co-payment apply with equal force to the PBS co-payment. So, Madam Speaker, yet, yet again more budget vandalism from the Leader of the Opposition. He's not content, he's not content uh, with opposing uh, everything that this government is putting forward. Now he's suggesting to the Australian people that if he gets elected, well, the PBS co-payment will go. I mean, Prime isn't Minister that what he is? Prime Minister will the Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Just goes to relevance. I asked the Prime Minister a straight There's question. There's no an excuse for repeating the question. Just do the point of order. Why won't the Prime Minister ever answer a straight question in the, the Prime Parliament? There's no point of order. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, ma Madam, Madam Speaker, I, I challenge the Leader of the Opposition. I challenge the Leader of the, the Opposition. The member for Newcastle is not to say in where he stands may on the PBS co-payment. Because if he thinks the PBS co-payment is a good idea, if you think that's fair, if you think that's reasonable, if you think that's just, if you think that's moral, well, how can he object to the Medicare co-payment? Because the principle is identical. Now, there is a difference between uh, this government and the opposition. This is a government which is serious about tackling Australia's fiscal problem. That is an opposition which created the fiscal problem and is now sabotaging every effort I can hear that this the government again on makes my left. to fix it. Madam Speaker, this is probably the most irresponsible opposition in Australia's history. It is the most irresponsible opposition in Australia's history. They were incompetent Bobby. in government and their wreckers in opposition. The member for Lawler has moved her seat. She is not entitled to interject. And if she insists, she can leave under 94A. Choice is hers. I call the honourable member for Macmillan. Thank you for the call, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline how the government is building a stronger economy? How does a stronger economy help the people in my beautiful, majestic home state of Victoria? I call the honourable the Treasurer. Well, I thank the honourable member and thank him for being such a, for a successful Ford Adelaide and Franklin member resist. for a great and memorable part of Victoria and uh, recognise that by building the east-west link it's going to be to the great benefit of the people of Gippsland and particularly to all those farmers that are getting their produce to the great Melbourne port. And of course, over the last 12 months alone, we have seen good government from the coalition in Victoria, supported by good government from the coalition here in Canberra, deliver real outcomes, real outcomes to the benefit of the people of Victoria. Of course, under Bill Shorten, the Leader of the Opposition as Minister for Workplace Relations, last year, 800 jobs a month were created in Victoria. This year, under the coalition, 3,200 jobs per month have been created in Victoria. So job growth in Victoria is now four times higher under the coalition than it was under Labor. Four times higher under the coalition. The members for Batman, Carayo, will leave under 94A. Yeah, yeah. Premier, the Treasurer has the call. Well, that's two less jobs on the Labor side, but greater productivity. <laughs> Maybe a few more can go as well. And the outcome, of course, is if on Saturday the, the people of Franklin Victoria them. vote in Labor, you're going under to turn up 7,000 new jobs associated with East West Link. And I'd say to the people of Victoria, if you care about 7,000 new jobs, them, vote for the Liberal and National parties on Saturday. Yeah. And I say to the people of Victoria, if you care about $3 billion of new road funding to build the East-West Link, do not give it up by voting Labor on Saturday. Vote for the Liberal and National parties. The and I say to the people of Victoria, the Treasurer resume, you said. The member for Greenlaw on a point Madam of order. Speaker, he's misleading Parliament. There's no new money. Yeah, there's no it's money new... that was taken the, off the, the metro. Member will resume his seat. No... The member will resume his seat. And he knows that's an abuse of the standing orders. If he does it again, he'll leave. 
The Treasurer has the call. And he knows it's wrong. And why? Labor is so indignant about the three billion dollars we're committing to the East West Link that they want to give it back to us. The of the they want to give it back to us. And not only that, we've got eight. other states that are now preparing to bid for that three billion dollars if Labor gets into government in Victoria on Saturday. Madam Speaker, the small businesses of Victoria want to see East West Link built. The producers, the farmers, the traders of Victoria want to see the East West Link built. The, the commuters of Victoria want to see the East West Link built. And importantly, 7,000 prospective workers in Victoria want to see the East West Link built. The only people that want to trash it are the Australian Labor Party. I call the member for Oxley is warned. The Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Are my questions to the Prime Minister. Last night there were reports that the Prime Minister was planning to scrap his unfair GP tax for now. This morning, Senator Abetz said the unfair GP tax remains our policy. Then the Minister for Health said that different options were being considered to replace the tax. Given that the government's own ministers can't get their lines right, isn't this just the latest example of an incompetent governor in utter and complete chaos? The Prime Minister has the call. And there will be silence for the answer. Uh, this, this from the Leader of the Opposition, who backstabbed two Prime Ministers, Madam Speaker. I mean, really and truly. This, this from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, who showed such loyalty that he knifed two leaders of his own party. Now, Madam Speaker, Mad Madam Speaker this, this the member for is a government warned. which thinks of Medicare GP co-payments but there's a better way of operating the a health system, Shortland is and the change should hardly hurt at all. As economists have shown, the ideal model involves a small co-payment, not enough As to put a dent in your Hotham weekly budget, warned. but enough to make you think twice before you call the doc, and the idea is hardly radical. Now, Madam Speaker, it's a, it's a, very, good, it's a very good position, and it's the position of Labor's shadow assistant treasurer. So, Madam Speaker, our position when it comes to no the Medicare co-payment is exactly the same as Bob Hawke's we'll put it down position. And hand it into the it's exactly the same as the Shadow Assistant Treasurer's position, and Attendant. it is the position that we are doing our best to negotiate with the Centre crossbench now. I, I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the Shadow Assistant Treasurer is not in his correct seat. He is waving around, he is waving around props. You asked him to put it away. He continued to wave it around in defiance of what you'd indicated to him. The opposition is an absolute rabble today, a cacophony of noise. And I, I would ask you to give a general warning and that the member for the Assistant Church, Show Assistant Treasurer, be dealt with. The Leader, the leader of the House, um, I'm aware of the position of front benches moving on the front bench. And in fairness to the member, he was. I did ask him to hand it to the attendant, and the attendant walked past him, and he did attempt to hand it to him. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I could not see the prop in the first instance because it was being blocked by the splendid head of the leader of the opposition. I give the call to the member for Melbourne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday and today, Prime Minister, you said in question time that East West Link will give inner city residents their parks back. Can you please advise the House which parks? Well, I'm glad the question is being uh, asked. The Prime Minister indicates it's asked to him because I could not hear because of the noise. The now, literally, if there is not silence, then more people will leave this chamber. If they want to catch an early plane, so be it, and don't want to represent their constituencies. It has got to stop that wall of noise. Now, the Prime Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, at the moment, as the member who asked the question should well know, uh, Hoddle Street, Flemington Road and Alexandra Parade, uh, which should be suburban boulevards, have 
become traffic canyons. That's what they've become. They've become absolute traffic canyons. I said and, and the people And the people who are living in and around these streets, the people who are living uh, in the suburbs uh, surrounding these streets, they deserve to have their suburbs and their parks back. And, Madam Speaker, the leader, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition thinks East-West Link is a good idea, or at least he did. At least he did until he was intimidated uh, by the need for green preferences into changing his position. And, Madam Speaker, the member for Kingsford and Madam Smith. Speaker, one of the many advantages of East-West Link Stage One is that it will also mean that Royal Park is a much better park for the people of inner city Melbourne to enjoy. I call your honourable member for Higgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, representing the Minister for Employment. Will the Minister update the House on the government's progress in restoring law and order on work sites in Australia? Who stands in the way of restoring the rule of law in the building and construction industry? I call the Honourable the Minister for Education, representing the Minister for Employment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank the member for Higgins for her question, because she like all members on this side of the House, believes in restoring the rule of law on building and construction sites in Australia. and That is why we are attempting to bring back the Australian Building and Construction Commission. When it was last in existence under the Howard government, it saved the Australian economy $7.5 billion and improved productivity in building and construction by 16.8 per cent. It was scrapped by the now Leader of the Opposition when he was the Minister for Workplace Relations, and who is standing in the way Madam Speaker, of restoring the rule of law on building and construction sites? Well, it is the Australian Labor Party. And in Victoria, right now, we have a state election where the Leader of the Opposition there, Daniel Andrews, has indicated that he will rip up the Victorian Building Code, that he will rip it up and allow the law of the jungle to operate on building and construction sites in Victoria. So the choice on Saturday is between the coalition government that believes in the rule of law in building and construction or the Daniel Andrews-led Labor Party, which believes in the law of the jungle. And I'm asked who is standing in the way, Madam Speaker. And unfortunately, the person who is most influential on Daniel Andrews in industrial relations is a man called John Setka the Secretary of the CFMEU in Victoria. And it's worth finding out who this John Setka is, Madam Speaker. He has quite a charge sheet. He was allowed to speak at the Victorian ALP conference. He's allowed to donate to the Victorian ALP. He's a member of Daniel Andrews' socialist left faction, and he's the most influential person in the Victorian Labor Party. And if Daniel Andrews wins on Saturday, he'll be the second most powerful person in Victoria. He did 60 days in jail for contempt of court in 1990. He did four months in jail for contempt of court in 1990 as well, a second offence in prison. He was convicted for threatening behaviour by the Federal Magistrates Court in 2008 and fined $6,000. He was found guilty by the Magistrates Court of the criminal offence of threatening or intimidating a Grocon manager in 2003. He was charged with five charges of assault, uh, two of assault, two of obstruction and intimidation of Commonwealth officials in 2009. This is the person Labor wants to put in charge of industrial relations in Victoria. So on Saturday, a vote for the Nat Bean Ryan government will keep the rule of law on building and construction. A vote for the Daniel Andrews opposition will put John Setka back at the cabinet table in Victoria, a man with a charge sheet, a charge sheet as long as his friend Mick Gatto's. I call the honourable the leader of the opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My questions to the Prime Minister. The Minister for Defence has failed to apologise for insulting the highly skilled workforce at the Australian Submarine Corporation. If he won't say sorry, why don't you just sack him? Here, here. I call the Honourable Lady Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the Minister has repeatedly said uh, how much he regretted that statement, which was something that was said in the heat of debate and which shouldn't have been said. Now, Madam Speaker, again, I remind the Leader of the Opposition the of his own record when he was in government. 
uh, the Leader of the Opposition cut $16 billion from the defence budget. Members opposite, all of whom sat around the Cabinet table uh, under the former government, were responsible for cutting $16 billion from the defence budget. They were responsible uh, for, for taking defence spending as a percentage of GDP down to the lowest level since 1938. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, the debate uh, in question was a debate about the Australian Submarine Corporation. It was a debate about the Air Warfare Destroyer Project. Madam Speaker, as the Australian National Audit Office found, thanks to the mismanagement of members opposite, thanks to the chaos and confusion of the former government, this project was at least $300 million over budget and it was at least 21 months behind schedule. So, over budget, behind schedule, yet another Port mess Adelaide that Labor created, yet leave. another mess that this government is fixing. And I want to thank the Minister. I want to thank the Minister for Defence uh, and the Minister for Industry for getting this matter in hand for solving a problem that the Labor Party has Bell created. Be silence. The member for Hotham will leave under 94A. I call the honourable member for Deakin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Justice. Will the Minister update the House on the government's achievements in taking a tough stance against organised crime and corruption in Australia? How will these measures make the streets in my electorate of Deakin safer? I call the Honourable Minister for Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and can I thank the member for Deakin for that question? And I congratulate him on his energetic uh, representation of his constituents since he arrived here 14 months ago. And he understands that since we've come to office, we've taken a tough stance against organised crime, and we've worked hand in hand with our Victorian state counterparts in doing that. Well, unlike the Victorian Labor Party, Madam Deputy Speaker, that seems content to let criminality fester within its ranks. Indeed, the Victorian ALP is in thrall of a rogue union, the CFMEU, with John Setka at the helm. This is a man who has vowed that the CFMEU will remain a militant union, and he's again. vowed that the CFMEU will continue to break the law a bit. Break the law a bit. This is hardly a surprising attitude from a union boss whose associates include criminal gang members and who has been called by Mick Gatto a close mate. A close mate. Since coming to government, the coalition has been working hard to detect and disrupt organised crime, particularly through the National Anti-Gang Squad. And we've worked hard with our Victorian counterparts to establish the Victorian Strike Team, which sees Victoria Police and Australian Federal Police officers sitting side by side. And I was pleased to announce that uh, strike team with Premier Napthine and with my friend and colleague, the Police Minister Kim Wells in Victoria, just over a year ago. Now, the key to success of this strike team is undermining the profit motive of organised crime. And we have been progressing along with our Victorian counterparts national unexplained wealth laws. And at the most recent Law, Crime and Community Safety Council, which met in Geelong, Victoria's largest regional city, all One state more. and territory ministers Braindler. agreed to continue to develop a national cooperative approach to unexplained wealth. In addition to this, the Victorian government has promised to tighten asset forfeiture laws for ICE dealers. And the coalition will continue to work with our Victorian counterparts to do all we can to crack down on organised crime, peddling ICE and destroying regional communities in particular. We on this side of the House Madam Speaker, are committed to taking a tough stance against criminal behaviour. When Labor were in government, they refused to unlock the proceeds of crime account, money which we have now unlocked since we have come to government and we are using to fight crime, investing over $3 million in um, proceeds of crime has been invested in, Victor in Victorian electorates uh, in Deakin and others uh, on CCTV and other crime prevention initiatives. On this side of the House, Madam Speaker, we will continue to work against organised crime. We will not accommodate it like the Victorian Labor Party and its leader, Daniel Andrews. And a vote for Labor on Saturday will be a vote for the CFMEU, and we'll see the Victorian government turning a blind eye to corrupt and criminal behaviour. The Leader of the Opposition will not get the call. 
until there is silence, and if that wall of noise starts again, it will be randomly asked for members to leave. Randomly. Because there'll be a general warning in place. Because a general warning is in place, and you are all warned. Now, the leader of the opposition, the honourable leader of the opposition, has the call. But unless there is silence, many more of you will be having that early mark you clearly want. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My questions to the um, Prime Minister. The, uh, the, the member will resume his seat. Sorry. The leader of the House. Madam Speaker. Is it in order, while you are admonishing the opposition, for the members for Graindler and Hunter to actually be interjecting on you as the Speaker? <laughs> the answer is no, and there should be no more of it. But all three of you, perhaps, should consider your positions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. The Minister for Defence has failed our Defence Force men and women by cutting their real wages and conditions, including Christmas and recreation leave. If he won't say sorry for cutting the real wages of our Defence Force men and women, why won't you just sack him? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, no one regrets more than I do that we cannot afford to pay people more at this time. No one regrets that more than I do. Uh, Madam Speaker, I have been to defence base after defence base over the last 14 months. Uh, I have visited our defence forces uh, in all sorts of different contexts, uh, Madam Speaker. I deeply respect, nay, I revere our defence forces. No one is more deserving. Uh, of the best possible deal than our defence forces, but Madam Speaker, uh, it comes a little ill of the leader of the opposition, who has helped to put us into the parlous fiscal position that we are in, to complain about the necessary consequences of the situation the that he created. Adelaide I mean, Madam Speaker, and the this is someone who not only knifed two prime ministers. Uh, but played a large part in the economic policies of the former government, which gave us debt and deficit stretching out as far as the eye can see. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The management of opposition business on a point of order. Surely on a question about our defence force, the Prime Minister can be relevant. The uh, member will resume his seat. The question was a very wide-ranging one and would ask for action which is anticipated by the Leader of the Opposition as appropriate. The Prime Minister is perfectly entitled to answer it. Prime Minister has the call. Ma ma Madam Speaker. <laughs> then the member for Hunter was also a digestion. He can leave under 94. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat and leave under 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. Is the Leader of the Manager of Opposition Business uh, anxious to join the member for Hunter? No, I'm not. Uh, but if I've got the call, I'll take a point of order. Indeed. How is the member for Hunter meant to resume his seat and leave the room? He can do it sequentially. It's quite clever. <laughs> Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, the job of the Minister for Defence uh, is to ensure uh, that our Defence Force personnel uh, have the best possible deal under all the circumstances. And, Madam Speaker, I can assure members opposite. Uh, that no one in the public sector will be getting a, a better deal than our Defence Force personnel, because our Defence Force personnel uh, deserve the very best from the Australian people and the Australian the government, and Griffith they will, will get much better uh, from this particular government than they did from the last one, which cut $16 billion off them and reduced defence spending as a percentage of GDP to the lowest level since 1938. 
I call the honourable the member for Latrobe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Will the minister inform the House how the government is delivering world-class infrastructure in beautiful Victoria? Are there any risks to these plans? I call the honourable the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Well, look, thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to respond to the question from the member for La Trobe, who is a fantastic member, and it's great to have him back in this chamber fighting for the people of the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. And he knows how important this weekend is for the people of the eastern suburbs of Melbourne because he knows how important the $3 billion commitment that the Abbott government has made to both stages of the East West project is, Madam Speaker. Uh, we are committed to this project because it will cut travel times for people living in Melbourne, it will increase our productivity and make Australia stronger. And that's why the infrastructure Prime Minister is so focused on delivering this project with an infrastructure Premier and Dennis Napthine who deserves to be re-elected this weekend, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, the, this is a, the first stage, I should say, the one that the member for La Trobe is particularly interested in, uh, is a project where the contracts have been signed. The contracts have been signed uh, by a lend lease led consortium uh, who's made up of overseas companies, Madam Speaker, as well. In fact, two thirds of the construction work will be conducted by overseas companies, Madam Speaker. Uh, in fact, uh, in addition to that, while lend lease has got the contract, they have been at market seeking the debt and the equity to fund the construction of this project. And that is well underway, Madam Speaker. Now, no, in the, in the last month, actually, Member for Grainler, and you should know how important this is, because the Shadow Treasurer knows how important this is. If you rip up this contract this weekend, you lift the sovereign risk of our country. You do what Swanee did with the mining tax. You, make, you put sovereign risk for Australia right back up front, don't you, Member for Lilly? That's what you'll do if you rip up these contracts this weekend. So the Shadow Treasurer made a very important point just a few weeks ago. He made a very important point, and we agree with the point that he made. We agree with the point that the member for McMahon made. Labor honours contracts. Labor in government honours contracts, Madam Speaker, entered into by previous governments. Even if we don't like them for issues of sovereign risk, Labor honours contracts in office signed by previous governments. Madam Speaker, it's just a pity that the Leader of the Opposition doesn't like the Shadow Treasurer and won't take his advice. He wants to take the Greens' advice, he wants to take the member for Melbourne's advice because he needs their preferences. But he used to support the project, Madam Speaker. He used to support the project, Madam Speaker. The Minister will resume his seat. Member for Grandler on a point of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker. We want to take Infrastructure Australia's advice. The member will resume his seat and leave under 94A. The Assistant Minister has the question. Ma Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition used to support the uh, East West project, not Correct. just once, but twice, in two submissions. Uh, when he was right. the Leader of the AWU, the Australian Workers' Union, he wrote for the Comrades' sub submission, the Australian Workers' Union believes that the new East West link is crucial to jobs and economic growth. Hear, hear, Madam Speaker. But the problem is with this Leader of the Opposition is you can't trust him. You cannot trust the Leader of the Opposition, Madam Speaker. Julia Gillard couldn't trust the Leader of the Opposition, Madam Speaker. Julia Gillard couldn't trust the man to stick with him. Wayne Swan knows that you can't trust the Leader of the Opposition, Madam Speaker. And Victorians on the weekend should know that they can trust with this Leader of the Opposition their jobs as much as Julia Gillard did with hers. The member for McMahon. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. It's clear that the Prime Minister lacks the leadership to sack the Minister for Defence today. Prime Minister, will Senator Johnston still be the Defence Minister when Parliament resumes next year? I call the Honourable the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, we are very tolerant of the Leader of the Opposition's questions, but the first part of that question was an assertion. The second part of it was entirely hypothetical, and it couldn't possibly be. It couldn't possibly be in order. The question is: the manager of opposition business on the point of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, if the prime minister's view is the same as the leader of the house's, there is no we're happy to leave it at that. In your seat. 
You can have a rephrasing of the question, although I'm tempted simply to rule it out of order because it is not within conformity with the standing orders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Prime Minister, will Senator Johnston still be the Defence Minister when Parliament resumes next year? Uh, look, that wasn't really a very successful rephrasing of the question. <laughs> we'll move on to the member for Reid. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member for Reid has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to. I'll yield. I, I might yield. Madam, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. The member for Shortland will desist. She is not in her place. Um, I think the interjections across the chamber will cease. The Prime Minister on a point of order. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, I would crave your indulgence to actually answer the question that the Leader of the Opposition put. I think the better way to solve this is we'll move to the question from Reid and then the, the Leader of the Opposition may re-ask his question. Okay. The Member for Reid. <coughs> I have ruled that the Member for Reid has the call. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. I can't see who's yelling for your back. Was that the member for Melbourne Ports? Well, in that case, you may leave under 94A. The manager of opposition business. I'm just wanting to inquire for the ruling you just gave. Is that a suggestion that that would be in place of our ordinary question after the member for Reid's question, or as an additional one? No, it's not an additional. The member for Reid has the call. Uh, I will return to the Leader of the Opposition following the question by the member for Reid. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That yielding is a lot overrated. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and might I add it's lovely to actually have her in the country. Will the Minister update the House on how the government has strengthened Australia's relations with our major trading partners in Asia and the benefits this will have for the Australian economy? Um, this really does feel like uh, the last week of the sitting. This is normally the behaviour we get in the last week. However, Perhaps if we hear a splendid answer from the Minister for Foreign Affairs, we may have some decorum return to the chamber. And then the Minister has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Reid for his question. And it is indeed a delight to be in the country because over the last few weeks we have demonstrated how this government delivers on opportunities for our exporters, opportunities for Australians to get jobs, because we know that Australia's prosperity and Australia's security depends on trade and engagement with our region. And we know that Australia's reputation as an open, export-oriented market economy is important because we need to ensure that we can create the jobs for the 21st century. That is why we have placed China, Japan and South Korea as key priorities in our foreign policy based on economic diplomacy. And just as traditional diplomacy aims for peace, so economic diplomacy aims for prosperity. And our policy finds its expression in the completion by our magnificent Minister for Trade and Investment in three free trade agreements with the major economies of North Asia. In the case of China, we will be able to slash tariffs on 95 per cent of goods. Our exporters will have greater access to a $10 trillion economy. In Japan, 100 per cent of our resources, energy, manufacturing exports will have tariff-free entry. Korea, the minister tells us, will add $650 million to our economy annually as a result of these three free trade agreements. Now, Madam Speaker, we said we would negotiate and conclude three free trade agreements, and we have delivered. And this does demonstrate our ability to focus on what matters most to Australians, and that is 
opportunities for our young people to have jobs, opportunities for our businesses to grow with new sources of capital, new markets and enhancing existing markets. Now, Labor said that free trade agreements were overrated. That was just an excuse for their lazy incompetence, because through commitment we have been able to ensure that our relationships with our three major <coughs> trading partners are better than they have ever been before. These are backed up by high-level dialogues between our Prime Minister, welcoming Prime Minister Abe to Australia in July, welcoming President Xi to the G20 and to Canberra for the joint sitting of the parliament, welcoming President Park to the G20. And the Trade Minister and I meet frequently with our counterpart ministers. And, Madam Speaker, this is what the new Colombo Plan is also about, building connections and networks between the leaders of the future. So our relationships with our three major trading partners have never been better, China, Japan and Korea, as a result of commitment, dedication and an understanding of what matters to create new jobs and create new markets for our exporters. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today, senior Australian Financial Review journalist Laura Tingle described the Prime Minister's budget strategy as dead, a seriously ex-parrot. Does the Prime Minister agree that his budget strategy and unfair GP tax are dead? Or, Prime Minister, is it just a flesh wound? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, ma Madam Speaker, uh, if I could... Uh, the member for Shorten will leave under 94A. Madam Speaker, if I could take the opportunity of this uh, moment at the dispatch box uh, to say that uh, I have full confidence in the Minister for Defence. Uh, and uh, can I say this of the Minister for Defence? Uh, he wants to be the Minister, and he is doing a fine job as the Minister. And if you look at the outcomes under members opposite, um, Labor had three Defence Ministers in six years. Their first defence minister was sacked, their second defence minister resigned, and their, and their third defence minister wanted another job. I mean, that's what Labor defence ministers were like. And, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister will resume his seat. I call the Honourable Member for McMahon. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister had three questions in which he could have expressed confidence in the minister, but he's not being relevant no in this order. one. Member will resume his seat. If you wanted to call a point of order, there's a proper way to do it, and, it's, and you know very well there is. One more breach of the standing order protocols, and you'll leave too. The Prime Minister has the call. So, so the point I make, Madam Speaker, is that uh, the idea that this fine minister uh, should somehow be disqualified from serving simply because of a mistake made in the heat of the moment is simply absurd. Now, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on, on the question of the budget, the member for uh, Blair. Our, our, budget, our budget strategy is simple. It is to get the budget back to surplus as quickly as we can, as responsibly as we can. And, Madam Speaker, members opposite uh, know that that's the right strategy because we have uh, statement after statement from members opposite uh, saying, and I'm quoting the Leader of the Opposition now, a budget surplus for a strong economy. So, Madam Speaker, they all know that a budget surplus matters. The problem is they never delivered it. They never delivered it. The famous statement of the uh, member for Lilly, the, member the four for years of surpluses that I announced tonight. Well, he announced that in 2012, Madam Speaker, Labor has not delivered a surplus since 1989. And Madam Speaker, on the form that members opposite show, Labor is simply congenitally incapable of delivering a surplus. We had the Leader of the Opposition uh, on radio the other day. Listen to this, Madam Speaker. We're more likely to get back to surplus under a Labor government than this current one. I mean, really, Madam Speaker, they've opposed every savings measure. This Member Leader of the Eden. Opposition has opposed the every savings measure, including his own. He's opposed every single savings measure, including his own. He's not trying to create a budget surplus. He's trying to sabotage a bu budget surplus. He, he, he says he wants a budget surplus. 
but he is not prepared to support a single measure designed to deliver it. So, Madam Speaker, uh, this is a Labor Party which has absolutely given up on governing or, 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 or even pretending even pretending to govern this country. They are incompetent in government. They are wreckers in opposition. They are, they are the budget saboteurs par excellence. I call the honourable the member for Wannan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Investment, or as he's more commonly known, Mr Trifecta. <laughs> Will the minister outline how local industries and service providers in my home state of Victoria will benefit from the Australia-China Free Trade Agreement. I call the Honourable the Minister for Trade and Investment. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for Wannan. He's a wonderful ad advocate for agriculture and a man with a big future. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's electorate. His electorate is set to benefit big time from this free trade agreement that was concluded a couple of weeks ago. As a region strong in dairy and beef and lamb and wool and wine and horticulture, agriculture worth $1.47 billion uh, to the Western District. With the free trade agreement, the Western District will see that beef with tariffs up to 70, 25 per cent will go. Sheep and lamb with tariffs up to 23 per cent will go. The Minister will me seat the member for Wills on a point of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, will the Minister assist the House by tabling the agreement to which he is referring? The, me the member for Wills will leave under 94A. That's an abuse of standing orders. The uh, Minister has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And of course, the Coalition is following the practice of the Labor Party and tabling the text once it's fully completed and been lawyered. This agreement with the Western District it, it will, it will remove tariffs of up to 30 per cent on wine. Fruit and vegetable with tariffs up to 30 per cent will go. Wool secures a new duty-free quota of 30,000 tonnes to grow by 5 per cent every year. And of course dairy is the really big winner. Tariffs of up to 20 per cent will the, go. The Minister will resume his seat. The member for Fremantle on a point of order. Madam Speaker, um, government members have been asking and answering questions all week about the China Free Trade Agreement. You just uh, speak to the, spe the standing order. The what standing, standing order, standing order, order 100 D1. Questions must not contain statements of fact unless they can be authenticated. Oh, the member will resume China his seat. Indeed. Having sat down, she too will leave under 94A sequentially. The Prime Minister has... The member will resume his seat. We resume his seat. Firstly, I will say there has been a general warning. Secondly, I will say the number of times that the, the standing orders are abused by members of the opposition trying to make argumentative and debating points in the standing order about the standing order they are trying to draw is totally and utterly unacceptable. And I suggest, Mr Manager of Opposition Business, you conduct a clinic for your members so that they can see how to do it properly. Oh, the minister, on a point of order, the Manager of Opposition Business. On a point business. of order. You've just ejected a member of parliament for taking a point of order in which he precisely quoted the standing order it was referring to. How is that an abuse? Because that wasn't the abuse she was ejected for. It was the argument that she put into the question. What? Now, there wasn't any. Which is totally against the way you raise a point of order. The minister has the call. The member for McMahon on the point of order. Madam Speaker, on the point of order. The member for Fremantle raised a point of order. You asked her to identify standing order, which she proceeded to do. At that point, you asked her to leave it's exactly at the time she named the standing order that she was referring to. I'd ask you to clarify the House, for the benefit of honourable members, what her offence was when she named the standing order, which she was alleging was abused. Madam Speaker, uh, clearly, on the points of order being taken by the opposition, clearly the manager opposition business in the House should explain to the member for Fremantle that the standing order under which she was quoting was about questions, not answers. Not answers. 
and therefore it was totally out of order. And the fact that she had to read it indicates she was put up to it in the first place. And the opposition should stop, should stop trying to disrupt the parliament and trying to make the difficult life for the government when they actually should be asking questions and eliciting answers. I thank the uh, Leader of the House for a quite useful intervention. <laughs> and indeed, the Manager of Opposition Business will also know that the only standing order that relates to the question and the way answers may be given is the one that relates to relevance. None of the other standing orders do. And speaker after speaker has pointed it out to the chamber. Now, the minister has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And clearly, those opposite have no interest in seeing their constituents have explained to them opportunities for growth and jobs. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the the opportunities for dairy for in Perth. Western District extend to infant formula, milk powders, liquid milk, ice cream, yogurt and cheese and so much more. This free trade agreement is rich not just for the Western District but for the whole of Victoria. But the agreement has the potential in delivering enormous benefits. These will only be achieved if the increased and the higher valued production can be delivered to the Port of Melbourne cost effectively. And in this regard, the construction of the East-West Tunnel is fundamental, fundamental to the seamless connection of the Tullamarine Freeway to the Port of Melbourne. Without the East-West Tunnel, many of the competitive gains from a free trade agreement will be compromised or lost through higher freight charges. The member for Kingston not only Smith that, is warned. Not only that, but the higher investment encouraged by the free trade agreement will be discouraged by the highly irresponsible action of the state Labor leader who has promised to tear up the contracts. He's a walking sovereign risk. Yes. Madam, Madam Speaker, so many of the benefits of the China-Australia Free Member Trade Hopkins Agreement Smith are under threat under in Victoria if Labor wins the state election this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I call the manager of opposition business or is it the member for Watson asking a question? Uh, Madam Speaker, the minister was quoting from a free trade agreement. I asked him to table the document that he was quoting from. Is the matter that the minister was quoting from confidential? <laughs> Can we have some silence? The minister. Madam Speaker, the, document, or the paperwork that I was, the notes I was quoting, were not the free trade agreement. The free, free trade agreement documentation is currently is currently being translated into Chinese. Then, as was the case when, as was the case with the ASEAN Australia New Zealand contract that Labor was responsible for, which took six months before you tabled the text. I, I think six Mrs. months. I'm not sure whether that was a question or whether you were merely asking for tabling of documents. So it wasn't a question. In that case, I call the member for Sydney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister, sometimes described as box office poison, be visiting Victoria tomorrow? Or has Dennis Napthine told him to stay away because he's no John Howard? <laughs> I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the question is clearly out of order. It offends Standing Order 100, uh, and it should be ruled out of order and moved straight to the government member. If the member for Sydney wishes to rephrase her question and make it in order, then she may do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister be campaigning in Victoria tomorrow? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Ma ma Madam, Madam Speaker, uh, I have been campaigning in Victoria three times. Three times. Three times uh, since the election was called. Madam Speaker, once to talk about uh, our infrastructure improvements that are being done jointly with the Victorian Premier, 
and those infrastructure improvements uh, are not just East West Link, uh, vital though that is, also the uh, widening of the Tullamarine Freeway, an absolutely vital infrastructure improvement that will only happen under a coalition government here in Canberra and in Victoria as well. So, Madam Speaker, I was there for that. Uh, I was there a member for Morton. to stand shoulder to shoulder with Premier Dennis Napthine uh, to announce uh, a police task force, a police task force be silence. to investigate abuses uh, by the CFMEU, abuses which people like the Leader of the Opposition effectively support, Madam Speaker. Well, let's, let's, hear, let's hear the Leader of the Opposition, a let's hear the the leader of the opposition the stand up and repudiate the CFMEU. I mean, I ask the Leader of the, the Opposition Charlton, to stand up and repudiate well, the CFMEU. The Leader of the Opposition wants John Setka to be the most powerful man in Victoria. That's what he does, Madam Speaker. And, Madam Speaker, by contrast, I was in Victoria standing shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with Premier Dennis Napthine to announce a joint Commonwealth Victoria Police Task Force to investigate and prosecute, investigate and prosecute uh, union criminality, union criminality, which has been connived at by years by members opposite. I'm not calling for your point of order. No, I'm sorry. There is no individually. No, and the member for. Oh, good. The member for Lingiari. I ask, I ask the Prime Minister to withdraw the imputation that I connive with criminals. He did. You did. Uh, there is no point of order, and the member for Lingiari will take his seat or else leave. The choice is his. I, the member for Morton will leave under 94A. I call the honourable member for Hinkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. Will the Minister inform the House how the world-renowned Harvey Bay seafood industry will benefit from recent free trade agreements? I call the honourable member for Agriculture. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I thank the, the honourable for member Perth for his question. Will leave under the honourable member, who comes from a farming family, so has great experience in farming, and I was reading about the honourable member and also found out that he was the Queensland Electrical Apprentice of the Year. An apprentice. So he's also got experience as a tradesman. A tradesman, very important. We might return to that later on. But it was also great to have uh, the seafood industry down here today, Madam Speaker. And we had a barbecue and. Uh, some of that product was absolutely exemplary of why Australia can export $1.2 billion worth of seafood a year. $1.2 billion worth of seafood a year. And because of the work that the Trade Minister has done, and it's not just in the China Free Trade Agreement, it's in all three. It's in all three trade agreements. We have a great new expansion of markets. For Korea, uh, we have a 20 per cent duty on rock lobsters and a 10 per cent duty on bluefin tuna, which is going to be removed. It's going to be removed because of the work the coalition does. The work the coalition does to try and make sure that we expand our economic base. Under the Japanese free trade agreement, which is a very important market for Australia, the tariff on lobsters, crustaceans, shellfish will be immediately eliminated, and the tariff on Australia's largest seafood export, tuna and Atlantic salmon, will be phased out over 10 years. In the Chinese free trade agreement, abalone, a major market. 10 to 14 per cent tariff removed over four years. Rock lobster, 15 per cent removed over four years. Prawns, 5 to 8 per cent removed over four years. Crabs, 10 per cent removed over four years. Whole fish, 10 to 12 per cent removed over four years. Shellfish, 14 per cent removed over four years. This means that money is going back into the Australian economy. This means we're getting a better price for our product. This means that we have a greater economic future because of the work this side of the chamber does to grow our nation's economy. And we should have realised that that would happen because we saw what happened to the exports from New Zealand when they had a free trade agreement, the massive increase in exports that New Zealand had. But of course, whilst, whilst we were frustrated that the Labor Party were in government, so what did they do? They did nothing. Well, they did suggest that they'd have the largest world national, the largest world marine park. 
and actually close people down, put people out of work, put people out of work. And it's not just the fishermen, and it's not just the shop owners, it's also the tradespeople. Because I was thinking if, if we've got the uh, former Queensland trades, electrical tradesperson of the year, how many tradespeople are on the Labor Party side? How many do you have now? Just put up your hand. Who's actually got a trade there these days? Who's got a trade? None. None yet they say they represent the Australian people. I know that the, I know that the member for Oxley actually does have a trade. Actually does have a trade, but that's, I can't see another one there. Not one. Yet you're supposed to be the party of the working man and woman, but you have no one these days with a trade, and that is why you are so out of touch. I call the honourable member for Ballarat. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the AMA president's comments today about the unfair GP tax, and I quote, it would be bad, particularly for vulnerable patients, and if you can't win over the parliament or the population, it's time to admit there is a problem with the policy instead of being petulant. Why is the government so intent on introducing an unfair GP tax by any means to make vulnerable Australians pay just to see their doctor? Yeah. 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 I call the honourable member for the Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. If uh, the member opposite uh, doesn't have the guts to ask me a question, I'll answer it uh, anyway. Now, Madam Speaker, let, let, me, say, let me say this. Uh, the, the Minister for Health, Rumpole, come on. The Minister for Health will resume his seat. The member for Isaacs on the point of order. I would ask you to direct the Minister to withdraw the disgraceful imputation that he's just made. There was so much noise I couldn't even hear it. If the minister has, in fact, made an imputation, it would assist the House to withdraw. Happy to, happy to withdraw, Madam Speaker. The Labor Party, when they were in government, uh, people will remember uh, the Rudd Gillard Rudd years. It was six years of absolute disaster uh, in this country. Absolute disaster. They received two separate reports telling them that the health system is currently unsustainable. Now, what did the Rudd Gillard Rudd governments do about it? Nothing at all. They spent more money on health bureaucracy. More money on health bureaucracy, and they took money away from frontline services. The commitment of this government is to get more money back to doctors and nurses and away from Labor's spin doctors. It's true here, and it's true in Victoria as well, because the Victorian government, under the leadership of David Davis there, has got the health system back on track. He's got it back on track in primary care and in tertiary care as well. Now, when it comes to Medicare, Madam Speaker, ten years ago, as the Prime Minister rightly pointed out before, we were spending $8 billion a year on Medicare. Today, we will spend $20 billion a year, bearing in mind that from the Medicare levy, we raise $10 billion a year, so a $10 billion gap and growing rapidly. In fact, over the last five years, it's grown by 34 per cent, and we know that within ten years' time, it will almost double again. Now, people who say that that is sustainable, uh, in the, really, when you look at it, it is the Labor Party. The Labor Party are the only ones who suggest somehow that giving away millions of the services each year Adelaide. are free. The proposal by the coalition oh, government sorry. is to make sure that we can provide support by retaining bulk billing for those who can't afford a $7 co-payment. But we have said that we will ask for a modest co-payment so that we can strengthen Medicare. Now, at the same time, Madam Speaker, yes, we do want to put money into a medical research future fund. Why? Because in states like Victoria, we know that for every dollar that we put into medical research, we get a $2.17 return. And in states like Victoria, we have the great capacity, Madam Speaker, to put those jobs into place in areas like the Peter Mac, an the outstanding the young, institution within seat. Victoria. And if we can put more jobs into Victoria, we can find the, the cures of tomorrow. We wouldn't have seat. Gardasil today if we hadn't resume invested into medical research in years past. The money that we put into medical research today will not only provide better care models so that we can have a sustainable health system in the future, not only will we have more jobs within the medical research sector in areas like Victoria, we will also provide for tomorrow's cures. That is the commitment of this government. We will make Medicare sustainable. We will take care of those that need to be protected, and we will strengthen the health system of the 21st century. I call the honourable member for Durbell. My thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. 
Will the minister update the House on the National Rental Affordability Scheme? I call the honourable the minister for social services. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I thank the thank the member for Dave Bell for her question. And uh, I, I commend her on the representation of the people of Wyong and the entrance and all those uh, areas in that part of New South Wales on the north coast. Well, the answer to her question about the National Rental Affordability Scheme is that it simply has not delivered the benefits that were expected of it. And why hasn't it delivered those benefits? Because of the poor and incompetent administration of it by the Labor Party. In June, June 2014, only, only 19,000 of the 35,000 dwellings had been built. Only 19,000 of the 35,000 had been built. 16,000 dwellings had not been delivered. Not only in the member state of New South Wales, but Manager hundreds of dwellings, business. hundreds of dwellings not built in Victoria and other states around Australia. And why was that? Because of the poor design and incompetent administration of the NRAS scheme. For example, foreign students were allowed to take up dwellings that had originally been designated for ordinary workers in this country. Trading incentives occurred rather than actually building dwellings in this uh, country and cities around the country. And more recently, we've discovered, again because of the totally incompetent administration of the scheme by the Labor Party, alleged fraudulent use of incentives. So, Madam Speaker, we are on about improving the administration. We have put in place a use it or lose it in relation to the remaining incentives, and we are not going to proceed with the last round, which is going to save the Australian taxpayer millions of dollars. But this is typical of the Labor Party's incompetent administration. And, and I ask, and, and this is also the case, as the auditor pointed out in relation to the Building Better Regional Cities program, which he said hadn't been implemented in a way that gave sufficient attention to the program's objectives. The guidelines had been ignored. The importance of achieving value for the expenditure for the taxpayer of Australia was simply ignored. And I wonder who was responsible for this. Who was responsible for this? Now, it's, it's, it's not an easy question because you know they had six. Six ministers responsible for housing under the Rudd Gillard Labor government. Six ministers responsible for housing. But who made the mess of it? Who made a mess of it? Well, none other, none other than Gordon. the member for Sydney. The member for Sydney. She's the one primarily responsible for the abject failure of this scheme, for the incompetent administration of this scheme. But what happens when you're a failure over there? You get promoted. You get promoted. So she got promoted so she could then make a mess of the health system in Australia, as the uh, Minister for Health has pointed out. As the Minister for Health has pointed out. But, but having failed twice, having failed twice, she's now the deputy leader. The deputy leader. If she fails again, she'll be the leader. I call the honour of the Prime Minister. I, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.